Mr. Gret Glier is a 2008 graduate of Trinity Christian School and a 2012 graduate of Grove City College. Gret founded Housing for Orphans and Widows in Malawi. There is a, a brief uh, bio in your programs uh, regarding him. Gret is the first member of our alumni ever to give a commencement address. I expect that we will have dozens out of the class of 2016 that will be doing this at some point in the future. We are uh, extremely proud of uh, Brett, Gret and what he's accomplished just in these last uh, few years. Uh, and we want you to hear about the work that he's doing in Africa and uh, tell you a little bit perhaps about how that came about. So, Gret, your alma mater warmly welcomes you. Thank you, Dr. Vanderpool, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and, and very honored. Uh, like he said, I, I was in their seats eight years ago, back in 2008, back when I looked like this. <laughs> and uh, my goal today is, is pretty simple. I, I simply want to, I'm, I'm thinking, if I could talk to my former self from eight years ago, if I could give advice to that guy and his classmates, what would I say to him? What advice would I give that person? And so to start off, I wanna talk about this mountain. It's called Nkoma Mountain. It's in the middle of Malawi, Africa, where I live. And the way the mountain works is uh, it takes about 45 minutes to get halfway up the mountain. And at the halfway point, there's a cabin and there's a place for you to put your stuff down. And then it's another 45 minutes to get to the very top of the mountain where uh, you, there's this beautiful overlook and you can see for miles and miles. And so um, I was hiking with a couple friends uh, a month ago, uh, Ethan and Austin. And the hiking is not easy. Uh, it's, it's very steep and you're often climbing on your hands and knees and when you're going down you're, you're kind of crab walking on the way down. And so we got halfway up the mountain at 5.15 p.m. and we were faced with a choice. Do we play it safe and wait till the morning to hike up to the top of the mountain or do we hike up at 5.15, get to the top at 6, right at sunset and then hike back down in the dark? What do you think we did? Obviously because I'm telling you this story we chose the dumber option. So we hiked to the top and we took this selfie that <laughs> the photography skills of my friends were not that great, but um, uh, we hiked to the top and then uh, we appreciate the view and if any of you ever have a chance to hike a, a mountain in Africa, I highly suggest you take it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great um, opportunity. And uh, my friend Austin, who's on the, in the middle, he brought a flashlight with him. And uh, Ethan and I, we didn't have a flashlight, but Ethan and I, are also faster hikers than Austin. So we started hiking down the mountain at a faster pace than Austin. So Austin's behind us, he's got his flashlight, he's going down very slowly, and Ethan and I are going down as fast as we can. And after 20 minutes, it's completely dark. There's no natural light left whatsoever. We were hiking down this side of the mountain and the sun set on this side of the mountain. So it's pitch black. And uh, you know, a few hiccups here and there, and then at one moment I remember my left foot uh, steps on a rock and it, the rock wasn't exactly stable, and so I put my right foot out to catch it. And I don't remember what happened after that, but Austin, who had the flashlight and was behind me, said he saw me tumbling forward. And as I, I, I kind of woke up a few seconds later and assessed myself, and I, I was really dirty, and I started brushing myself off, and I had scrapes on my, on my leg and on my arm. And uh, my, <laughs> the way I fell, I, my, my head is towards the bottom of the mountain, my feet are towards the top of the mountain, so I'm literally, I'm like on my back, pretty, pretty bad, and uh, I, I feel this pain in my leg. And so I, I, I reach down to my leg and I feel the back of my calf, and I feel my bone. And I start screaming. <laughs> Thankfully it wasn't too high pitched, and I start saying, my, my leg is broken, and, and I'm, I'm freaking out, and all of a sudden all of these fears wash over me. I start, I start worrying, like this is going to be the worst night of my life. I'm, I'm on top of a mountain in Africa, dark, and my leg is broken. What, like what, what do you even do in that situation? And so Ethan and Austin are cautiously walking towards me as I'm screaming, and I'm slowly calming down, trying to assess the situation, 
I pivot, I, I sit up, and I, I'm just holding my leg, and a funny thing happens. As time goes on, I realize that the pain in my leg isn't getting worse, it's actually getting less. And so I cautiously bend my knee, and I'm able to, and then I stand up, and I'm able to put pressure on my foot, and I look over at my friend Austin, who's a medical student, and I say, <laughs> what's going on? I thought my leg was broken. I just felt my bone. And um, Austin explained to me that sometimes uh, we get these very strange calf uh, spasms, and uh, they feel really bad. And you, they kind of coagulate towards the back of your shin. So it does feel like a bone, um, but my, I was fine. And I walked down the rest of the mountain the rest of the way, and I even played frisbee later that day. Like, I was totally fine. Um, and I, I share that, with, that story with you to, to get my first point across, which is I'm calling fear. Oftentimes we have this relationship with fear where going into it, we're really afraid of, of what might be. Right? With, with my leg, I was so nervous and scared about a situation that was completely non-existent. And you guys, I think, you, and obviously in retrospect, I can tell you, like, that didn't make any sense. And you guys, I, I think you have a good understanding of this. Uh, when you just finished your senior thesis and uh, the entire time going, like your entire high school career, you're thinking, oh man, how am I going to do a 20-page paper and be on a board in front of, uh, uh, present my beliefs in front of a board? How am I going to do that? And now that you've done it, it's kind of like, okay, like it was hard, but I did it. And I, I, I could do it again. And uh, it's easy to look at these things in retrospect, right? We can look at, look at in retrospect and you can, tell, you can tell the juniors and the sophomores, guys, don't worry about the senior thesis. It's not going to be that big a deal. But looking forward, it's a lot more difficult. So you're about to go to college and you probably have a bunch of questions about uh, what's it going to be like to have a roommate and to not have parents and to do my own laundry. All these questions <laughs> that you're not sure uh, what the answers are to them. And it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge to be in that situation but I can, I'm going to promise you something. Two weeks after your first day of classes, the first, two, the first couple of days you're going to be shooken up a little bit. That's, that goes without saying. Two weeks afterwards, your college life is going to be just normal life. It's, I, there, there will be difficult things. There will be challenges. But uh, a lot of these questions that, that you're worried about right now won't be a big deal two weeks in. I do remember a time uh, when, again, I was worried about something that wasn't necessarily... Uh, appropriate. So I, I'm, this is me at the, uh, at Dulles Airport before I'm about to board the plane to go to Malawi for the first time. And I'm with my future roommate, Woody, who's wearing a fanny pack. That's how he likes to travel. And uh, we're, we're at Dulles Airport and we had just signed up. We didn't know a single person in the entire country of Malawi. And we had just met a month earlier. So we, I mean, we were going really blind to this thing. We're going to be living in this country for the next year of our lives. And we don't know what to expect. I mean, you hear, you think of Africa and you, you think of a lot of different things and not a lot of them good. And so we're in line uh, at the airport and, I, and we're, we're getting in line to board the plane and I turned to Woody and, and I said, man, I can't believe, it's kind of weird. I, I can't believe I just took my last hot shower for a whole year. And Woody was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, <laughs> And he kind of like let it go. And then when we got there, like we had electricity, Wi-Fi, hot water. Like we have everything. It was, it was completely unfounded. But I do remember a situation a few months after arriving where my fear was more legitimate. This is my friend Blessings. And um, three months after I uh, arrived in Malawi, I, Blessings came up to me and said, Hey, Gret, I, I'd like to show you something in a village. Would, would you mind coming with me? And I said, sure, let's go. And so we, we go to this village, and uh, we, get out of the, we go, get out of Blessing's truck, and we start walking. And this is one of my first experiences in, a, in like a, a legit African village, right? I, I'm living in a, in a city in, in uh, Malawi, but this is my first experience living in like rural, impoverished. And uh, I'm walking through, and I'm seeing there's grass thatch huts, and there's kids playing in the dirt, and there's people making food on campfires, very, there's no electricity, there is no running water in, in, these, in this village. And we're walking through, and we're getting deeper and deeper into this village, and I'm just, I'm following blessings, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, I don't know why I'm there. And uh, after, we, after we go for a while, uh, we see this lady 
named Rosina off in the distance. And as soon as Rosina sees me, you can kind of see it, there's a, a stick next to her. As soon as Rosina sees me, she grabs the stick next to her and she picks herself up and she hobbles, she starts hobbling towards me and blessings. And we're getting closer and closer and closer. And as soon as she's close enough, she falls onto her knees and she sticks her hand out uh, to shake my hand out of respect. And so uh, I shook her hand and I turned to Blessings and I said, Blessings, why did you, why did you bring me here? And Blessings said he talked to all of the village chiefs in the local area. And he asked, he asked, who is the most vulnerable person in all of your villages? And, and they all got together and they agreed. It's this lady, Rosina. And uh, as you can see in the picture, I mean, she's the definition of skin and bone. She hadn't eaten in a week. But there was something even, even more pressing than that. Uh, she didn't have a house, and we were a month away from rainy season. So it, the situation was, if she doesn't get a house within a month, uh, she's in big trouble. So Blessings brought me out there because he wanted me to help provide a house for this lady. And so I asked him, how much does it cost to build her a house? And I'm thinking 10000 20000 at least. And he said, well, it's going to cost $800. And I couldn't believe it. I, I was like, that's how much I spent on my last iPad. I was, I was floored by that. So uh, I really exciting, excitedly gave Blessings my camera. And I said, all right, Blessings, you're going you're gonna to film me and Rosina. And I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna, we're going to film a video. It's the first video I ever made. It's up on YouTube. I'm very embarrassed by it. And uh, I, I stood with Rosina, and I said, this is Rosina. She needs a house. Uh, she's she's, she's going to be uh, going to, she's, rainy season is coming in a month. And if she doesn't get a house, uh, she's in trouble, but it only costs eight hundred dollars to get her house. And so I posted this video on YouTube, and I set up a PayPal button, and I I was really excited to to release this to my friends and family. And so I was trying to get eight hundred dollars, and I posted this online. And do you guys know how much I raised? A hundred dollars. I was I was really upset. I was I was actually very very sad. As you can imagine, I had just met this lady who was frail and respectful and just like really well, precious. And for the first time I realized, you know, maybe not everyone cares as much as I do. And that was a very difficult thing for me to experience. It was one of the hardest days I ever had in Africa. And so I thought, who is my, who is my um, audience? Who, is the, who are the people I'm trying to reach? And I, I realized, you know what, I'm, I'm trying to get this video out to Northern Virginians. And so, they're, it's not that they don't care, but they have things that, they like doing things a certain way. And so I realized they like spreadsheets and pie charts, and they like to know exactly where their money's going. So that's what I did. I put together a blog post where I had, I said, this, I'm not taking a cut. This is exactly how everything's going. Um, we're working within the power structure of the village, and you guys can see exactly how we're spending the money. And so that $100, after I posted that blog, it turned into the full $800, and we were able to build her a house. And it was finished the day before rainy season came. The, the roof was put on the house, and then the very next day, this torrential downpour came. And, and I, 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 a lot of times I go back and I think, man, what if that never, what if we were, uh, I don't want to think about all that stuff. And so this was a really cool experience for me. And by the way, if any of you were to come out with me to Malawi, right now and, and go to Rosina's village and go and try and meet her, I can promise you that she's going to treat you the same way that she treated me. As soon as she sees you, she's going to walk towards you, and then once she's close enough, because she has trouble standing, she's going to fall down and put her hand out to shake. And the reason I know this is because I brought my family out there and we got photographic evidence of her doing this. And so I, I really enjoyed this process of providing houses for people, and so uh, as I, I realized I like fundraising. I like uh, distributing the money to the people who know how to use it. And so I built a website. I built homes.org and I started a 501c3 nonprofit to accept donations. And uh, we've been, I've been doing this thing for the last two years and we've raised, uh, we've built almost 100 houses for people. And as time goes on, the, this organization has become more and more automated. I, my involvement with it, I, I try and delegate as much as I can so that it runs on its own. And so as, as my role, as the time it took for me to be involved in this organization became less, I started looking for the next thing. And so I was, sometimes when I, 
when I come up with an idea, I have like laser-like focus. Like I want, I'm gonna, I don't care about anything else. I'm gonna accomplish this next thing. So the next thing I thought of was, I'm gonna build a clinic in the middle of one of these villages. And it's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be awesome. And I was, look, I was talking to different doctors and I, I came across this lady named Tia. I was telling her about this clinic I'm gonna build. And Tia said, you're not gonna build a clinic. And I said, yeah, I'm gonna build a clinic. And she's like, no, you're building a girl's school. And I said, no, I'm building a clinic. And she's like, no. And she handed me a document, a vision document for something called Girls Shine Academy. And it had everything in it, the land, the curriculum, the, where the school teachers would come from, where the students would come from, the, the construction plans for the school. It had everything. It was written seven years ago. And she's been praying for a way to make this vision a reality. And so I take, took a look at it. And I was like, this is way further along than my clinic idea. Let me, let me like seriously consider this. And, and as you know, uh, the, the school has been going really well. We, we've, put, we've, we've done quite a bit of construction on it, and we're hoping to open up in September. And that brings me to my next point, and this might be the most important one that, of the three that I share with you today. I'm calling it failure. And I want to take you back to that first video I made where I released it, and I only raised $100, and it was very embarrassing. It was very hard. And there was that situation, there was that moment where I could have said, I tried, and I failed, so that's it. But what I want to stress to you is uh, everything that happened as a result of me not uh, putting up with that failure, of me treating that failure for what it is, a learning experience. Uh, we, we went from building one house to 100 houses to a girls' school to me talking at this commencement. None of that would have happened if I had let failure get the best of me. And so when you are in a situation where you might fail, I want to suggest that you have two options. One, you can let failure be a detraction. You can let failure defeat you and, and, and uh, deflate you. The other option is you can see failure for what it is. It's a, it's a really good learning experience that you, that, uh, that you can uh, take and learn from. I want to tell you about my latest project. I've been working on something for two months and I haven't told anyone about it. And, uh, but before I do, I'm going to tell you about this girl named Emily. I met Emily around the same time that I met Rosina. And two years before I met Emily, Emily's mom got really sick. And so Blessings, who was doing ministry in that village, uh, realized that Emily's mom needed $20 to get better. And that's a lot of money in a country like this. A lot of people, that might not seem like a lot here, but there when you live off a dollar a day, $20 is a significant portion of your income. It's, it's, it's not easy to just come up with that. And so, Blessings emailed a friend of his in, in the States and said, hey, we need $20 uh, to help this Emily's mom. And the guy in the States uh, didn't quite understand how severe the situation was. And he, he, didn't, he had never been to Africa before. He wasn't sure he could trust Blessings. So he said, I'm not going to give you the $20. And then six months go by, and uh, this guy comes out on a mission trip, a short-term mission trip with a team of people. And Blessings is taking them on a tour through this village. And as they're going through the village, they see this lady lying on the ground. She's baking in the sun. She's got these really bad sores on her legs. And he's, he's looking at this, and he's, he's horrified. He's, he's, what is this? He's never seen something like this before. And so Blessing says, oh, you remember the lady that needed $20 six months ago? This is her. And so this huge revelation washes over this guy. And he realizes the implications of not giving $20 six months ago. And he says, he talks to his team, and he says, all right, you know all of the plans we had for this short-term mission trip? Forget them. Our, our, our new goal for this trip is to help this lady. So they did that. They, uh, they took her to the hospital, and they got her a mattress, and they bought her food and medicine. And after the two weeks was up, they had done everything that they could. And she seemed to be getting better. And... Uh, they were about to get on the plane, but they got her a few more supplies before they left. And then they did get on the plane, and they went back home, and uh, things were looking optimistic. But 24 hours after they left the country, Emily's mom passed away. And uh, Emily's dad was no longer in the picture. So Emily is this girl that every Friday, I'm out in Malawi. I go out to a village, and I play soccer with these young kids. And I see Emily every single Friday. And she's such a like, fun-loving kid. She's always hanging out with her, her friends. Uh, but I'm always reminded of this story. $20 was the difference between her being and not being an orphan. 
And so I was, I've been wondering, I wonder if there's a way to prevent stuff like this from happening again, right? Emily's story isn't one of a million. Emily's story is, she's one of a million. I mean, every, every, this is a common thing in these developing countries. And so I started asking, I wonder if there's a way to prevent stuff, stuff like that from happening again. And so I've released an app in the iPhone app store called DonorC, which is a really easy way for people to fundraise for small needs like what Emily's mom had. And you can, it's in the iPhone app store if you want to check it out. I share that with you because I want to, I want to express something that I, this is, this is the third piece of advice and I'm really excited. Uh, I, I, it might not be expected, but I'm really excited to share this in particular. We live in a remarkable time. The, the realm of what's possible, of what you can accomplish, is being redefined on a daily basis. And the people who are changing the world are not that much older than you. Sometimes they are your age. And so I want you to realize the amazing potential that your lives have. So if I had to sum up all, of the, all three of the advice that I gave you in this one talk, I would say I want you to avoid fear by embracing failure so you can capitalize on the future. I graduated from Trinity eight years ago. And Trinity is a remarkable, set a, a, an amazing foundation for my life. And at the time, I didn't even realize how powerful it would be. There are two things that, that really make, that really just set Trinity apart from any other school. The first is the quality of, of the education. Uh, Trinity is gonna pro has provided you with uh, an education on par with any other elite boarding school or private school out there. That's the one thing, right? You can get a good education other places. Trinity also provides a good education. But then there's a second thing that sets Trinity apart, and I've never seen this anywhere else, and that's the faculty. The, the faculty at Trinity care about you on a personal level and a spiritual level, and I've, I've never come close to seeing anything else like that. And at the time, I took it for granted. All of my teachers were like that, so I just thought every single teacher was this like, really nice person that cared about me personally. I thought that that was normal. But if you spend some time going to other schools, you might find out, no, there's actually maybe one or two teachers that really take an interest in you, but the fact that every single faculty member is so invested in your life, that's unique to Trinity alone, that from what I've seen. And so I have uh, a lot of, I'm really proud of you guys, and parents, you should be really proud of the education that they've just received. They are being set up really, really well for the next several years of their lives. And I am especially confident in you all. I have a, a special appreciation for you, and, and I, I expect big things from your class in particular. And the reason is because over the last two months, you guys have come together, you've worked together to provide support for a girls' school in a rural Malawian village. I'm really proud of you guys. Thank you for your time.